So hi, we have Lauren Hoffman. She's from Heartwork. And um, we're going to talk about coping with anxiety in times of crisis. Um, in this world today, oh, feel free to mute your video and audio <laughs> if you don't want video in it. <laughs> um, let me see if I can do it for you. Um, okay, so in today's climate, we are experiencing something that is so rare with coronavirus spreading around and having to hunger down in our homes. And with postpartum, um, I know for me anyways, it doesn't really go away just because the world is different. It actually probably heightens, it probably gets, you know, mixed in with other different symptoms and things like that. So we have Lauren who works um, primarily with postpartum women. Um, but tell us about what you do and tell us about you and um, yeah. Yeah, hi, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Lauren Hoffman and I am a clinical psychologist in Richmond. Um, and I have a nonprofit organization called Heartwork Wellness Collaborative, and I work downtown. Um, and yeah, one of my areas of specialty is in kind of um, pregnancy and postpartum issues, uh, what are now called perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Um, I'm also, I consider myself a generalist, so I see um, all different kinds of issues, um, a lot of depression, anxiety, life stress, relationship. Um, issues, uh, kind of the whole gamut. Um, but yeah, I, one of my specialties is working with um, people who are pregnant or uh, newly in the role of motherhood. Um, and also, uh, I, I work a lot with kind of stress and lifestyle medicine type of issues. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I think all of those different areas um, apply to a lot of our moms that come, you know, participate in our group. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's hard in that postpartum period, because I know for me, it wasn't something that was explained. Um, it wasn't mm -hmm. something that I knew from my doctor or from my mom, from my family, from my friends. Um, like you hear about postpartum depression, but you don't hear about a lot of the other um, things that can happen when when you're postpartum so right. it's it's just it's a whole different it's a whole different world <laughs> and um yeah so it's just i'm really glad that you know we started this group that we can talk about it have this conversation um so i guess let's dive in since i know we have limited time um but so how are you and your family handling this crisis like how has it impacted you personally? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure like a lot of other people, this um, all feels a little bit surreal. Um, it's like we're living in some kind of alternate universe uh, where life has just completely taken kind of a 180 and we've had to make a lot of different adjustments to our daily schedule. Um, we've had to cope with a lot of the feelings that are coming up around this. Um, I think as a mom, you know, you're trying to juggle how to potentially for the first time in a while, you know, have your kids back in the home all day, every day, um, or arrange for their childcare. Um, some moms like myself are still trying to work. Um, and so it's a lot of logistics and trying to figure out just how to get through the day. And that's on top of dealing with the stress of what's going on and the uncertainty, I think that's been the hardest thing to deal with is just, you know, not really knowing um, what's going to happen, um, and, you know, what to even pay attention to right now. Yeah, so, I mean, with the news, it's, it's hard to tell what is real, what it's not, because with social media, with, mm -hmm. you know, just everything that comes with the internet, you know, to, decipher what is what's real and what's not is hard and then like you said the uncertainty is very unsettling I guess um, yeah. 
And yeah, and then needing to socially distance from your support system. You know, I, my family is, a lot of my family is here in Richmond, but I feel like I can't see them, you know, or be around them, um, which is just really, it's hard and it's sad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my family's all up in Maryland too. I totally get it. It's hard because you want that comfort of your family, but at the same time, you don't want to put anybody at risk. Right. Um, so for me, I know anxiety is heightened. It's, I've already had um, anxiety postpartum and now it just feels like the uncertainty of that plus the uncertainty of children too is, you know, it's, it's hard to know whether this will affect kids, what, whether mm -hmm. this, you know, would the end in sight also. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's such a weird time. Um, yeah. With, with postpartum issues, like specifically anxiety, um, what kind of tips do you have to manage heightened anxiety um, in, I guess, in this current situation, but also um, helping it kind of translate into the parenting world too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there are probably a lot of strategies that can be employed right now. Um, the ones that I've noticed have been, you know, even most helpful for me have been trying to just really stay present because it's very easy for our mind to start spinning um, with kind of ideas or, you know, catastrophic thoughts about what might happen or what is it going to look like in a month or how many months are we going to have to live like this or, you know, who might get sick that I know. And um, I, I find that that is going to increase anxiety. So as much as possible, you know, bringing your attention just to whatever moment you are in. Um, and I find having kids is actually really helpful because they are often so mindful and so in the moment. And so I try to just kind of join their world. Um, I might even just pay attention to like the details. You know, I notice my son's fingers or look at that, look, really look at their eyes or watch how they smile while they're on the swing, you know, just really kind of the basics of our senses. Um, you know, what are you seeing right now? What are you smelling? Um, feeling, you know, just really trying to bring yourself into this moment um, and not let yourself get carried away. And I think along with that, you know, as we feel our, our anxiety start to ramp up, um, we can be present. We can notice those physical sensations that come with anxiety and, um, you know, breathe through them, try and actually relax our body because our body and our brain kind of operate in a feedback loop where if our brain is telling us there's danger, our body is going to respond. And then our brain picks up on what our body is doing too. And so if our body is in a state of tension, our brain interprets that as there is ongoing danger. And so, you know, if we can kind of notice if, if we're holding um, tension in our body, if we're, you know, holding our breath, um, if our jaws are kind of locked, we can um, check in with ourselves about that and, you know, relax our jaw, take a slow breath, maybe even like loosen up the body a little bit, uncross your arms and legs um, and create that sort of safety signal in the body so that your brain picks up on it too. That's, those are awesome ideas. And it's funny that you're mentioning um, kind of listening to your body um, with what you can feel, hear, see. I was um, listening to a different podcast today and they were talking about how Liz Gilbert, I think it was Liz Gilbert, she had posted something um, called the 54321, which is a method mm. that she had posted before, but um, relates to what you were just talking about. It's like five things that you see, four things that you hear, I think. Yeah, was, I think it's four things. Yeah, it was like all the different senses, three things that you can feel, two things that you can smell. Um, so it's like taste. the Yes. Taste. Yeah. Um, so it was, yeah, the different five senses and, you know, doing that exercise with them on the podcast today, I was like, huh, there's a lot of things that, you know, in the busy everyday life of going and, um, you know, being on the go with the kids all the time. Cause I, I went out with the kids seven days a week, you know, mm -hmm. and then not being able to do that anymore 
being in tune with your senses is really kind of, it's, it's interesting. It's enlightening and it's something that I don't do on a daily basis. So it's, it's really kind of um, calming to do those things and to be yeah. in the body. Um, yeah. So I think those are great, great suggestions to help with anxiety for sure. Yeah. And I noticed that, you know, as much as is changing around us, if I just look out into my backyard, nothing has really changed, you know, and I take in the scenery and the smells and the sounds, um, everything is, is the same there. So that can help bring some sense of normalcy too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and as far as the parenting part of it goes, um, what do you suggest as far as, or like, what are your tips with parenting during this kind of environment and having more screen time or less schoolwork activities, um, mm-hmm. less normalcy with going out with the kids or schools, like breaks in routine, I guess. Um, how do you suggest um, dealing with that kind of anxiety as well? Yeah, <laughs> we think we all have to acknowledge that we are living in a different time right now. And so the old rules just can't really apply. Um, I think if we focus first on regulating ourselves, um, you know, I think about how we're modeling this. A lot of the, especially younger kids have no clue what's going on, but they can pick up on our stress levels and our anxiety. And so if we can, you know, even if we have to take five minutes to go and breathe or, you know, focus on our senses, um, regulating ourselves so that we can kind of feel more in control as we're parenting. Um, I know my son, my four-year-old, um, his emotions have been a, a little bigger this week too, and not because he knows what's happening, but because he can feel, you know, something is off. And so um, if I can keep myself calm, I think that will translate into him being a little bit calmer, um, and then my life is easier. Um, and so, you know, using whatever skills you can for yourself, a big one I think is going to have to be self-compassion. Just be kind to yourself above all else. Um, do what you can, but, you know, understand that we're going to have to be flexible right now. You know, if, if you're working and parenting, you're not going to be able to give 100% to work or 100% to parenting. And so we have to just understand that, you um, Flexibility is needed right now. Acceptance is needed right now. If your kid is getting a little more screen time than they usually get, you know, that is okay. Um, We're all just doing the best we can right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, screen time has been kind of more lax around my house for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we try to couple that. I've I've been trying to couple it with um, educational activities as much as I can. but also knowing that I don't do the same things that his teacher does. Um, I have the benefit of like, I was a preschool teacher back in the day, but you know, that was eight years ago or something like that. So it's, it's different. It's, it's hard to, you know, props to teachers because it, I only have two kids and that's hard. It's hard to, you know, keep up with what I know that they're doing in school and, also doing the cooking and the cleaning and the kids and behaviors. So it's, you know, it's all the things at once and it's, and it's a lot because you can't really take a break and go to a social gathering. But um, yeah, yeah, I think you're right with the, you know, things in the backyard are the same. Things in nature are the same. It's just a huge adjustment, especially I think for our society, which is very busy, very on the go. Mm -hmm. Um, also pretty social, Mm -hmm. but I think it's, it's definitely an adjustment for a lot of Americans. Um, yeah. And just people in the world. Cause I I think our world has gotten so busy. Um, thank God for social media. We can actually keep in touch with people, um, and not feel as alone in this whole thing. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, this is really a forced slowdown, you know, Mm -hmm. lives have to simplify right now and slow down and, there are some ways that maybe we can benefit from that. And I think that's helped me to just focusing on, you know, the extra time I do have with my kids right now and um, more time to get outside and, you know, it is spring and the weather has been beautiful. And so 
Um, I've actually, as I've walked around my neighborhood more, I've seen families out playing. Um, and I, that's not something I, I normally see. Um, so I think there is some opportunity in slowing down as well. Yeah. And I know, um, probably a lot of parents, um, are working from home Mm -hmm. and I know my husband is, and I'm not used to seeing him, you know, on a daily basis for this many hours, but, um, it's been really, I think beneficial for him and for me to see what he does every day. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just from a different perspective, a different seat, and then he gets to see what I do every day. And it's really kind of helped our relationship in a way because it yeah. always, you know, it caused me a lot of anxiety to, um, to do all the things in the house and then um, kind of thinking about what his perspective is on it and not having the house clean always stressed me out because I didn't know what he, what he would think about that. But he mm-hmm. sees how the day goes. And even though we're all in the house, it's still tornado central with both of my kids. So, um, so I think that has been a huge benefit, um, as far as my mental health goes and for him to also see, you know, how crazy the kids are, but also how, um, how sweet they can be when, when they are calm. Um, Mm -hmm. so he, he's been able to see a lot of different sides of the kids that he doesn't normally get to see. And I think it's really helped him develop a stronger bond with them. Just awesome. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how anxiety kind of manifests in people in general, just like general anxiety, but also postpartum anxiety? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, anxiety is a, a really crucial emotion. It's something that we're all hardwired to feel. Um, it's, evolutionarily very beneficial. Uh, if, if we didn't feel anxiety, you know, we wouldn't survive. We need to know when there's potential danger so that we can respond effectively. Um, and so, you know, it, in a lot of ways, anxiety is our friend. However, it is also one of the more uncomfortable and distressing emotions people feel. Um, I think that it can cause a lot of suffering um, when it is you know, disproportionate, when it is out of control, when it's causing or manifesting in a lot of, you know, uncomfortable physical sensations, or when it's causing you to, you know, isolate or spend all of your time ruminating about something. It obviously can become something that um, impairs, you know, your functioning and your quality of life. Um, But I think when we understand just like what its purpose is, um, that can be one way of starting to get a handle on it. Um, And if you think about you know, every house has, well, hopefully has a fire alarm in it that, you know, detects smoke and, and goes off and alerts everybody in the house that there is a fire or danger. Um, and then people in the house can respond, they can get to safety. Um, and our brain is equipped with something very similar. Um, when we um, sense any potential threat, uh, and, you know, these days that threat is not the same as it was in our caveman ancestors. Um, You know, we're not usually threatened by um, wild animals or our shelter crumbling or, you know, a food scarcity. Um, We might be threatened by a relationship conflict or an email from the boss or a messy house. You know, there's all these kinds of threats that are creating stress for us, um, but our brain still responds in the same way. Like, as though we're in a life or death situation. And that alarm bell goes off and it leads to, um, you know, a lot of uncomfortable physical sensations that, you know, if we were running from a lion, our heart is beating faster, it's pumping blood to our extremities so that we can run to safety. Um, You know, it, it causes all of these symptoms that are actually part of our survival response. Um, And so, I think the the idea to kind of befriend anxiety can be really helpful um, and to notice that its intention is to help us and keep us alive, but sometimes it's just really misfiring um, or it's um, creating a problem for us. And I think when you're talking about motherhood and especially, you know, early early in the um, 
child rearing process or what during pregnancy even um you know there is a lot of variables there like our hormones are you know fluctuating in in very intense ways we're often sleep deprived we're physically uncomfortable we're socially isolated um there's all of these vulnerabilities and we also have this brand new human being that we're responsible for and so anxiety can just go into hyperdrive. It's like we're in fight or flight all the time. And every potential threat becomes a crisis. Um, and so, you know, I think there are a lot of ways I was talking earlier about kind of retraining the brain to recognize that we're not actually in danger. And you can do that through different coping skills that aim to kind of relax the body. Um, but then there's a lot of kind of cognitive strategies too of just like first accepting that the anxiety is present and kind of talking yourself through instead of trying to make the anxiety go away um almost like thanking the anxiety for showing up and trying to keep you safe um but then redirecting your focus on the facts because anxiety often is not going to present us with facts it's going to present us with what ifs and worst case scenarios and you know very extreme situations um, so I think, uh, challenging that anxiety a little bit with some real world fact-based or even, um, observation-based, like the, the senses, um, that combined with working on relaxing the body is kind of our best defense against out of control anxiety. Those are great. Those are great tips. Um, I know something that I was experiencing postpartum was postpartum anxiety, but I didn't know that until my second. Um, is that mm -hmm. common, um, you know, to have anxiety postpartum, not know, and then get diagnosed later, um, or just not even knowing that you have postpartum anxiety? Is that something that you found is common among postpartum women? Yeah, I mean, I think generally we've always heard about postpartum depression, which I think you mentioned. Um, and, you know, there's sort of one way it's supposed to look. And so some of the women who maybe are experiencing a lot of anxiety or sometimes um, that postpartum experience um, presents with a lot of anger, um, sometimes like a detachment or an inability to connect to the baby. There's all these different ways it shows up. Uh, but anxiety is extremely common. I mean, you know, like all of those variables I just discussed, and especially with being so responsible for the life of another human, um, I think anxiety in some ways makes more sense than depression as a reaction to having a baby. You know, your life has changed so much and there is a lot of uncertainty. And, um, you know, while access to information can be really helpful. I think to every other article when you're a new mom seems to be about what can go wrong or, you know, how the baby might be, you know, in danger somehow or what you need to be doing right and what you should avoid doing wrong. And um, I think that kind of context and climate uh, makes it really hard to relax in, into parenting. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely see that, especially with the internet now, um, you know, mm -hmm. looking back at when my mom was a new mom, um, it's hard to tell if the anxiety would have been the same. Um, but I think with the internet, the endless amount of information that we have, the endless mm -hmm. amount of opinions that we also are yeah. exposed to, um, plus opinions at the grocery store, you know, there's, everyone has an opinion, yeah. how everyone's mother. There's a pressure to do it perfectly. Yes. I think that's, unreasonable. Yeah. And I think that's something that I know I struggled with. Um, I am a recovering perfectionist. Um, mm -hmm. but that was something that I felt like was important. I needed to get it right. I needed to do, you know, parenting perfect and there is no perfect way to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, so if, if someone is experiencing postpartum anxiety, or if you think that somebody else is, or, you know, you're not sure, what kind of, what resources um, would you highlight that you think, you know, someone should reach out to you as maybe a first step or second step? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, maybe first 
step is reach out to your per individual uh, village, whatever that is, whoever that is. Um, if you have one, I think that it's really difficult to ask for help um, as, an, as a new parent. Um, but I think we have to get comfortable with that. We need to have our village. And so reaching out um, to other moms you might know who have been through it, I found for myself that, you know, there's sort of this um, sisterhood or like it's, it's almost like entry into a very select club once you become a mom where you all share this secret about how hard it really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that uh, those other moms can be a great resource for even just saying like, yeah, I felt the same way. You know, that there's so much relief when you hear something like that. Um, if you have family around, friends around, coworkers, you know, I definitely encourage people to set up the meal trains, um, you know, ask for help if it means somebody's going to come and do your laundry for you or clean your house for you while you just sit and hold the baby. I think that it's really valuable to um, accept help where you can. I think if you find that the anxiety seems really disproportionate or is getting in the way of you being able to live your life or care for your baby, um, there are a lot of great resources out there. I mean, you can even start at like your OB or the pediatrician. Um, most of them usually have ideas about sometimes in office, you know, doulas or lactation consultants or other sort of support people. Um, you can talk to. They also usually do have lists of therapists and counselors in the area that you might go and speak with. I um, think, you know, because um, postpartum, um, you know, responses uh, of depression and anxiety are just, they're so common um, that, and, and also so treatable, it's really important to go and talk to somebody as early as possible, kind of, um, almost taking a preventative approach. Um, and then there are therapists that are listed on, um, there's a website called Postpartum Support International. And most states have their own chapter. So there is a Postpartum Support Virginia. And on that website, they list all of the therapists, you know, in Virginia who are trained in working with perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And um, I'm one of those therapists and we are actually, uh, like we have to, be able to see new moms or, um, you know, people struggling with pregnancy within, I think it's like 24 or 48 hours, um, you know, when we agree to be on this list. So you will get in with somebody. Um, I know that sometimes there's a worry that you have to call, you know, 20 therapists before you get a call back. But um, I think especially with this population, um, therapists feel kind of a duty to respond quickly. Um, and you know, therapy can be really valuable, even if you go for one session, um, but you might end up going for, you know, the whole year after you've had your baby, um, just for that ongoing support. And, um, you know, a lot of the therapists will allow you to bring your baby into session with you so you don't have to worry about childcare. Um, there are people out there who are trained in helping you, you know, bond or connect with your baby as well, because, you know, that's not always uh, natural in the beginning. Um, so I think trying to allow yourself to be helped, um, recognizing that you're not, there's nothing wrong with you if um, becoming a mother isn't everything Pinterest says it's gonna be. Um, and that help is available. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, that's where I found my therapist on postpartum support mm -hmm. in international or Virginia. Um, and it's such a great resource for everything, even beyond therapy. It just, you know, gives lists of things that you can do um, mm -hmm. places where you can, it just has a whole lot of information on how to um, manage at home and cope at home. Um, yeah. I think it lists support groups as well. Most of the oh, yeah, major right. hospitals here in Richmond have a support group like once a month or once every couple of weeks. Um, and I, I think that website lists those, but otherwise you can also just call one of the hospitals and find out 
um, when the support groups are meeting and those can also be really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. And most of them are free. Um, yeah. well, I think all of them are free maybe. Yeah. Um, and so I know a lot of people, um, are not able to go into therapy right now, like person to person therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, is there any resource that you recommend that does teletherapy or online therapy? Yeah. So actually most of the therapists, um, probably around the country, but, um, I know in, in our community, um, most have kind of moved to telehealth platforms. And so we are still seeing patients, um, just, you know, like this over the, the, mm -hmm. oh, um, interface. And so I think that that should not prevent anybody from getting started with therapy. Um, it, there's obviously some different dynamics that happen, but, um, you know, I think like, I, I know I, I'll speak for myself. I am still accepting new patients during this time. I'm still doing intakes and having, you know, just regular 45 minute to an hour therapy sessions with people. Um, and we'll continue to do that until, you know, we get the all clear um, to go back into the office, but um, there are certainly, you know, ways that uh, therapists and other healthcare professionals are making themselves available right now. That's awesome. Um, and I know from, I think it's from postpartum support, um, you can search, or maybe it's psychology today. Um, you can search by insurance, which I yeah. found really helpful because then, you know, if you find someone that meets your criteria, but then they don't take your insurance, it, you know, it can be kind of distressing, but um, to search from by insurance, I don't know, I found it very helpful. Um, so to wrap up, I guess, where can we find you? And um, do you have like an online presence or um, a website or any other projects that you're working on also? Yeah, so um, this specific nonprofit business um, is actually relatively new. I started it at the beginning of this year, of 2020. Um, so I'm still kind of building up an online presence, um, but I do have a Facebook page and it, the business is Heartwork Wellness Collaborative. So um, I'm on Facebook, I have an Instagram account and that's Heartwork RVA. Um, so people can follow me there and reach out to me there. I have a website, which is also heartworkrva.org. Um, and that is kind of the most comprehensive place that lists all the different ways to reach me and some of the things that I offer. Um, but I have uh, been offering primarily um, individual therapy. I do some couples work too, if that's what people are. Um, I am planning, I, I was, about to get these off the ground, but kind of stalling right now to see how all of this plays out. But um, I'd love to be doing some group therapy. Um, I also have completed my uh, yoga teacher training last winter. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna be doing some kind of gentle yoga for mental health and create um, yoga groups that um, kind of focus primarily on managing depression and anxiety and kind of more mental health struggles. Um, so yeah, I have a lot of, of stuff in the works um, and hopefully all of this stuff with the virus passes soon so we can get stuff off the ground. But in the meantime, people can still you know, reach out, ask questions, schedule individual therapy. Um, I'll be posting things on, the, on Instagram and um, yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know I found it really helpful, all the information that you've shared with us, and I hope other people find it helpful, um, comforting, somewhat healing also, um, just because I know this, this time is really, it's hard. It's hard to yeah. you know, keep the kids entertained, keep yourself calm in all of it. Um, so yeah. I hope people you know, were able to get the information that, at least a little bit of information that can be helpful. Yeah, and I would say just kind of in one more um, in the last few minutes here, um, you know, stick to the basics as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You know, the best ways we can take care of ourselves are by getting enough sleep, feeding ourselves well, <coughs> excuse me, eating well, um, moving our bodies, socializing, 
Um, it's harder to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Got a tickle. Mm -hmm. Socializing in whatever ways you can. <clears throat> um, you know, people are still out there. We're all in this together. And so um, doing what you can just to take care of your body and your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, which can be hard to do with um, just, you know, in the pause of life right now, but it's, it's doable. And I think we should use this time to kind of refocus on mm -hmm. ourselves and refocus on our children in the, mm -hmm. in the ways that we may not have in the past. So, yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us and I hope you have a good night and thank you too. we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, if you want more information on motherhood in the raw, check out our Facebook page. Um, it's motherhood in the raw RVA. And, um, we also have a website, motherhood in the raw, um, rva.wordpress.com. Um, we look forward to seeing you at our events and we'll chat soon. All right. Bye. Bye.